Hello, I'm Robert Royal. I'm the editor-in-chief of The Catholic Thing, which is a daily column series. And these are the podcasts of The Catholic Thing. In fact, this is the last in our series on the uh, Synod on Synodality, which concluded over this past weekend in Rome. Um, and we're publishing this on our site under the category, The Vatican Thing, to distinguish it from what we do normally. Uh, I'm happy to be joined again in this episode by my colleague, Father Gerald Murray, who I'm sure is familiar with my, many of you. She's, uh, he's a uh, pastor in the uh, a parish in the Archdiocese of New York. He's a canon lawyer, and he's my unfailing guide <laughs> as a sidekick on the papal posse on EWTN. So, Father, good to see you. We're both back in the United States, so... Um, this is now a, it's authentically American commentary on what's going on in, in Rome. Father, uh, we have the report. We, I don't know if you've had a chance to read through all of it. I've read through parts of it and some of the commentary on it. But very early on, I'd just like to read one passage because we've heard this before with the Holy Father talking about the style of God and the style of some some new style is taking place very on, early on in this um, interim report, which has been uh, approved by the delegates in Rome. Uh, the report states, I'm quoting here, the multiplicity of interventions and the plurality of positions voiced in the assembly reveal the church that is learning to embrace a synodal style and is seeking the most suitable ways to make this happen. Now, as we know, style is not a theological term or historically uh, something that we talked about in the church. What can you make of an assertion like that? I agree. It's uh, not a theological category. In fact, it's troubling because, um, you know, style for most people means their preference, how they dress, uh, how they decorate their home, what kind of car they own. Uh, it's a way, uh, you know, whatever they do in life that expresses their personality is their style. Now, we do speak about in the life of the church that we want to follow the style of the saints, how they lived. But um, that's a general spiritual advice that we give to people. When it comes to matters of doctrine, uh, we don't call that a style as if it was a personal preference. So um, this talk, I think, sometimes uh, abets that notion that the synod is trying to have it both ways, have a definite meaning, but then have an indeterminate meaning, and you're not quite sure where we stand. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, just as a writer and as an editor, the style of the text is something that, that makes me worry a great deal. I'm going to quote another uh, passage early on in, in the document, because um, this kind of suggests what at least the, the writer's put forward as a, a, a description of the style. And and we continue to read in this document, by the way, that people are still confused about what synodality means. But this is, I think, an example of what they consider to be writing the writing style about synodality. And I'm quoting again. Synodality can be understood as the walk of Christians with Christ and toward the kingdom, together with all humanity. Mission-oriented, it involved it involves coming together in assembly at the different ecclesial levels of life, listening to one another, dialogue, communal discernment, consensus building as an expression of Christ making himself present alive in the spirit, and decision making in differentiated co-responsibilities. Now until the, the toward the end there, I was I was okay with this, walking together with other Christians in Christ toward the kingdom. But this differentiated co-responsibilities, I have to see, I have to say, kind of uh, flashed up at me. Your reaction to that? I agree, Bob. That is uh, differentiated co-responsibility. That's basically shared authority. And I think it's uh, in, uh, something that's indicated throughout the synodal process and in this uh, reality of a synod with lay people and bishops together that there's an attempt to decentralize the church away from the Pope and the bishops into having a sort of consensus building gathering of all the baptized. Um, and that is not the purpose of a synod. It's not the nature of governance in the church. Uh, it's very troubling. 
<clears throat> the other thing about that quote that you read, um, the departure point for the Christian life is not our common exchange of ideas as we walk together. Uh, the point of departure has got to be Jesus Christ, his revelation, and uh, his active and living presence in the life of the church. Uh, so the teaching of Christ is as alive today as it was 2,000 years ago, but it depends on us to make it known to others. So we don't walk with people simply to learn what they're doing, as with Jesus on the road to Emmaus. We want to impart something. Yeah, this, that uh, quotation seems to imply that there are going to be um, some differences, that there are going to be some convergences. I know you've, you've spoken about this, that uh, we were supposed to hear about the, the divergences as well as the convergences that occurred during the course of the Synod. Uh, there, don't seem to be, there doesn't seem to be a record of too much in the way of divergence. Uh, Am I wrong? Yeah, I, I've been reading. No, no, you're right. In fact, Diane Montagna tweeted about this today. Uh, during the buildup, or let's say during the process of the Senate undergoing uh, discussion, uh, the press office at the Vatican was constantly saying each discussion will consist of consideration of convergences and divergences, and from that there'll be a synthesis. So that the methodology was those in favor, those against, and we'll see what we come up with. The report has convergences. But then it has matters for discussion. It doesn't have a section on divergences. And then it has proposals. So I see a problem here. What you told us they were doing is now not what we're getting. If they were going to follow the same process, we would have had a list of where they agree, a list where they disagree. And then proposals might con consist of how we come together on some disagreements. But if we really don't know what the disagreements are, how can we really come up with what we would call this consensus building that the document talks about? What I think behind that is, Bob, I'd like to get your view on it, is they don't want to highlight the fact that people disagreed on some fundamental questions. So they're going to smooth it over as matters for discussion, meaning further discussion might lead to an elimination of divergences. Well, maybe yes, maybe no. What do you think? Yeah, I think we do know that what happened, and, and um, some people have looked at, there was a draft that was given to the participants, I think Wednesday or Thursday, when I was still in Rome, and that the draft that they eventually approved um, is significantly different in a lot of ways. Everyone has been talking about in the Catholic you know, uh, internet uh, commentaries how the term, the very term LGBT has dropped out. And I think that's to the good. I, I've written that to give the, to, to, to make that use of, the, of that acronym kind of common in the church is to already have conceded much of what goes on in the secular world and, and makes the church have to kind of hurry up to, to catch up with how to comment on what something that has already been predetermined out in that secular world. The other thing that I, I think is quite remarkable is that um, the, the the votes have been published. I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the, the tallies point by point, but um, we don't know what what exactly happened in terms of the change in the language about LGBT. There there is language of of, of discerning how to deal with people uh, in in different sexual of different sexual orientations, but the. The points that got the most negative votes had, in, I think, in, in one instance, 67, and another instance, 65. It was about the role of the women in the church and restudying the idea of deaconesses. So um, while those two hot button issues, it seems, were pulled back a bit by some uh, some protest within the process, maybe points were debated, and somehow we arrived at what we, we, we have right now. But it's interesting, I think, at least, that those two things that were, uh, on the doctrinal level, the most worrisome, were moderated a great deal, and maybe, as some people say, postponed for next October. But um, what, what can we say? So much of what's in here is uh, hard to figure out, at least in those two specific points, uh, we seem to have made some progress from where we were even just five or six days ago. Yeah, I, I find it uh, yeah curious that those things were left out, and I can only assume that they were left out because uh, 
there was so much opposition to it, they didn't want to pretend that there was a convergence of views. On the other hand, they didn't want to identify what the exact divergence was either. There's sort of a, a tendency in this document to hide divergences. Uh, they also fall back on this pattern of, if we can't get agreement on something, we'll call for further study. Um, there is no revelation to be made on the question of women deacons that has not already been found in the historical record. The question, of course, is the interpretation of the historical record. That's also been very, in my opinion, uh, conclusively decided on that there, there were no women deacons ordained as clerics who exercised the diaconate in preaching and sacramental ministry the way the diaconate is understood in the church. But that you know, resolution is now going to be left to further study. Uh, I agree with you 100 percent. I'm glad those act, the acronyms left out because it, the fact that it was in the working document gave the indication. Well, the Catholic Church agrees that, for instance, there's a category called transgenderism. And if the Catholic Church thinks there's a group called transgenderism, well, guess what? We should support the fact that men pretend to be women and then go win, uh, you know, women wrestling matches and things of that sort. We, we shouldn't we're not into we don't agree with that at all. We shouldn't get into that from a doctrinal point of view. And certainly pastorally, it's devastating. You know, what do you tell all the girl athletes at your Catholic high school that the boys from the Catholic school across the street, a few of them put on skirts and they're going to you know, play field hockey with you, knock you, knock you down. So, yeah, the, let's hope and pray that this issue will be resolved. And I'll say one other thing about it. The only bad thing, of course, is, well, what about the church's real apostate to people have a problem with homosexual attraction? Why isn't that highlighted? And that's, you know, sometimes, as you know, Bob, as an editor, what's left out is more important than what's put in. And I'm wondering if that's going to be the case. I'm still studying it. We'll, we'll get back to you with that uh, at a later mm -hmm. time. Yeah, I have to think that the, the removal of the acronym was a tactical measure because that may have been the one um, precise point that would have shown a, a negative uh, majority rather than a positive majority. It's usually the case in these documents that by the time they get to the end, almost everything is approved by very wide margins. And that happened again in, in, this, uh, in this instance. But it was, on, it was on those two hot button issues that there was some, let's say, massaging of the language, which probably is, as you rightly say, one way to kind of keep out uh, declaring how deep a, a divergence there was on, particularly on the LGBT points. Um, let's move on a little bit. Uh, I've been struck with how much we are still talking about the Holy Spirit and the spirit of synodality here. And we know what, what um, mischief the spirit of Vatican II caused after the actual council. There's a whole school of thought, and it's it's one that I think the Holy Father is not far from. It's a whole, there's a whole school of thought that, that considers Vatican II to be less important for the documents, the precise worded documents that it actually passed, as opposed to some open spirit that was supposed to continue on from that point. In fact, the, the uh, this fi final report of the first half of the, the synod talks about how the church is still a uh, church of the Second Vatican Council. So they're kind of keeping open that possibility. Several actors, I think, have talked about the importance of the spirit here as even opposed to this document that was just passed. So there, that kind of same pattern, that same framing of what's going on it has now been been applied to this process as well as this previous process of Vatican II. And I want to just read two statements by Cardinal Blaise Supich of Chicago, who's, um, as we know, is, is rather close to the Pope. And I, I think among the American um, hierarchy is, is uh, probably the, the most outspoken representative of what um, we're, we're looking at a synodality, maybe along with Cardinal um, McElroy from San Diego. But he said after the document was passed, he said that um, maybe the real synod on synodality was the friends we made along the way. And of course, that's perfectly fine. Christians meeting with one another, finding out that they have differences, but they can live and let live and maybe understand one another better. This is all to the good, it seems to me. It's all, all to the good for any human group to be able to arrive at uh, a certain friendship. But he continued, the document is not as important as the experience we had. 
Now, this kind of relying on experience, as, as you know, is um, it's to start from from individual human beings rather than to start with God. We the, Christianity is based on a revelation from God, not on an anthropology of going around and asking people what, what they think. Uh, what, what's your reaction to that, the, that emphasis on experience? Well, uh, your question reminds me of something that happened when I was in the seminary. We had a silent retreat uh, that we were all supposed to go on. And one of the uh, seminarians said, are we going to observe silence or the spirit of silence? Uh, and I laughed because everybody knew what the spirit of silence meant. It meant you could talk when you wanted to. <laughs> Uh, and that's, I'm afraid, what happened with the Second Vatican Council. To say that the council is more than its documents is to say something that the church never teaches. Uh, the documents that were voted on and then approved by Pope Paul VI, that's the council. That's what we refer to. So to, by analogy, say, well, the, the synodal document is in second place to the synodal experience that we went through. I don't know what that synodal experience is. There is no common experience because everybody, number one, is individual. But secondly, depends on who you talk to. That's why it's curious that some things that were on the agenda never made into the final report. What were those discussions? You know, I think what's underlying it is the question that we've discussed uh, on this podcast and then also on the papal posse, an attempt to rejigger governance structures in the church so that no That's longer right. are bishops rulers in the church rather they are conveners they're the people bring together all the interest groups quite frankly in the diocese lay people religious whatever uh, and then they want to arrive at a consensus that's in this document the idea that consensus is the manifestation of synodality well jesus couldn't get consensus you know when he preached about uh, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood in order to have eternal life uh, the only consensus that we get is a trumped up consensus of, you know, the, when it comes crucify him. And that didn't reflect any true consensus because the people who wanted to defend our Lord, they were silenced. So in the church, the idea that consensus reflects the voice of the Holy Spirit, not really, maybe, but not really. What really reflects it is fidelity to the truth. And as you said, this is a revealed religion. If I start from my experience, that's self-centered. In fact, it could be self-worship. If I start with Christ, then I have to open myself up to what he's teaching. Yeah, and it puts a very strong emphasis on contemporary experience, too, because the church has had an experience in all sorts of different contexts under different political regimes, economic regimes, cultures, civilizations uh, as well in the long 2000 year mm -hmm. history. Um, I think you're exactly right, though, to point to this idea of the, the governance. Um, it's one of the things that concerns me that, um, first of all, it looks like there was some controversy over whether to uh, recommend that there be a perpetual synodal process ongoing. I don't know exactly what wording or what form it is. I just happened to notice it in the document, and I want to go back and I want to look at it more carefully. But it seems like th there... So at least some people inside the Synod Hall want the, the synodal process to go on now forever in the same way that, say, the Senate and, and the House of Representatives continue to meet and legislate and debate in, in a democratic regime like here in the United States. And that would be a major change, obviously, in the way that uh, the bishops and others now would be advising the Holy Father. And I think that ultimately, I've called this the great white whale of the uh, of, of the, the synodalists, you know, like from Moby Dick, that they, their ultimate aim is to go out there and really find a different way to get decisions made than uh, presenting things to the Holy Father and then having him contemplate them and, and try to decide about them in the, in the light of the tradition and its own understanding of what they're up to. So I think we're going to be back to talk about governance structures and perpetual synodality in the very near future. Father, that's all the time we have today. Uh, thanks very much for your clarifications. You are always a light in the darkness in these matters, and uh, I'm sure we'll be back together again very soon. Thank all, all of you. Thanks all to all of you who listened and watched as well. And we'll see you uh, very soon when there's further news to bring you.